Yo, what is good? This is it. This is the final bit of Cine 230 Remix Cultures. We are fitting to be done here. So, uh, found a new location, yo. It's a beautiful day out. So I planted myself under my favorite oak tree on the property. Maybe I'll give you a wide angle shot of it just so you can see the, the magic of it. I love come, coming out here and sit, sitting out here in the back pasture just chilling, but today we're gonna to talk about something I'm very passionate uh, about, which is sampling and music. And we're gonna actually set everything off with a film called uh, Copyright Criminals, um, which is a documentary about the nuances of, of copyright. So coming into this class, you should have read a few articles by Kemba McLeod, read a little bit of his book, uh, Creative License, and then we'll watch his film called Copyright Criminals. As a uh, a sort of um, disclaimer, uh, I actually worked on this film. I did some uh, music and DJ mixes and stuff for this film, which is, which is pretty dope. I um, was real happy to, to contribute to this. So, um, but we're going to watch that. And yeah, and then we'll talk about sampling the music and then sampling uh, in the fashion industry to kind of talk about remixing, you know, in another industry that's, that's free to sample. Um, and that's largely based upon Joanna Blakely's uh, TED Talk that you'll watch for the next class. But I yeah, hope you all had a good weekend, a uh, good term, you know, for what it is being away and uh, learning remotely online. I hope I didn't bore you too much. I'm sure, I'm sure I did. Um, but, you know, the good thing about, you know, a remote or online class is you can always just fast forward or move on to the next. If you had me sitting in the analog, I would you'd be subject to my boring rants uh, for the whole time, uh, unless you just want to get up and walk out, which is also always funny when, I, when that happens. I love that. But uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a great weekend. I learned how to uh, uh, chainsaw uh, maintenance and ascent for trees. So check out this picture. I'm about 50 feet up in an oak tree. So it was my first day, um, you know, getting up a tree and limbing and doing stuff like that. But me, me and my dude dropped a bunch of trees by my barn uh, which was pretty dope. And then he's teaching me how to, how to, how to do tree work. So, um, which will be a lot of fun. I had to rip 30 foot vines of poison oak out of the damn trees before we started. It was crazy. Like stuff like that big, thick around coming out the, the base of it. Um, it was crazy. But anyways, so as we get into the movie, all right, I want you to write down these questions. They're, they're, they should, you should be able to download them from the canvas site. But, um, you know, just to kind of go over them, these are like the viewing questions I want you to ponder, consider, write some bits down. Um, and some of this stuff will be on the test based upon what we talk about. But just think about, you know, what are some of the arguments for and against sampling as presented in the film? You hear some voices um, that are very pro-sampling and then um, some voices that are not at all, um, that are less, you know, or maybe more neutral. Okay, um, you know, and we're primarily going to focus on like sampling in hip hop music, um, really where, you know, the concept of making popular culture out of other people's music uh, com comes from, you know. Um, so also think about what are some good quotes that show how sampling is valuable. And, you know, I want you to think about why is using, <clears throat> you know, what, John Philip Sousa, if you remember the bearded dude with no mouth, right? Called Infernal Machines. What's so revolutionary or evolutionary, I guess, about using, you know, these playback devices to create music and using people's records, what you're supposed to just simply consume um, as productive forces for, for creating content? Um, what are some of the values of sampling? Like, how does it add value to music? Um, you know, some of the ideas that the artist put forward about like, why is it valuable? Um, think about what they have to say and also think about how it could disvalue music. So there's some examples in here um, that like kind of demonstrate lazy sampling, uh, taking something that's cool and doing very little to it and making a lot of money off of it. Maybe that's not as cool, you know? And then also think about how it can create um, revenues for new artists, okay, or old artists, excuse me. So how can 
new music based upon old music create new revenue streams or pathways to um, you know financial means for old artists who maybe kind of have fallen off. Um, do you think that sampling, you know, at least as the film presents it, is theft or tribute? Like, is it stealing? Is it borrowing? Is it tribute? Like, why do people actually sample? And I want you to think, too, um, you know, about, like, who does and doesn't get paid from sampling? So we're going to get an example of the funky drummer, Clyde Stubblefield, um, who drummed on probably one of the most sampleist records of all time, the funky drummer. He never got a penny for it because the author by law, um, the, the right songwriter by law was James Brown, you know, although Clyde created that pattern. Okay, so think about like why certain people get paid and why certain people don't. And also think more a little bit about just the general economics, which the film goes into. Um, I think too, yeah, how is copyright law adapted to digital sampling? And then how have sampling artists adapted to the law? That's really, really important. So as law changes, uh, court cases happen um, to kind of catch up with the technology, how, to, how do sampling artists then sort of undermine that? Okay. There's two landmark cases presented in this film. What are they? So just pay attention. One's De La Soul and the Turtles, and one is Gilbert O'Sullivan versus uh, Bismarcky. Just pay attention to those, and we'll talk about the Bismarcky one uh, later. And then think about like socioeconomics, um, institutional racism, etc. I mean, you have these early sampling cases where you have particularly, you know, black artists you know making beats getting sued often by white rock artists right and then go to court if they actually go to court and face you typically a white judge and jury you know um how could you that be a form of institutional racism so how does like identity politics and stuff like that kind of from your perspective play into sampling law you know um, you know, especially when you have a lot of people early on who didn't think it was music, who didn't think rap was music, didn't think rap was going to stick around, um, didn't think it was creative in any way, um, which we all know is total horse shit. Um, but I, I think just sort of think about the, some of the politics, uh, around race that, 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 that play out here, although it probably doesn't get into it. Okay. Uh, so much. And, Think about how Kembrew made this film legally. Like, how was he able to make this film legally? Um, and, you know, how does fair use uh, play into that? And then again, some of the music he need, he got for this film, fair use didn't apply. Like, people made beats that got used in it. So what type of licenses would he need for those, uh, for those pieces of music? Okay, so that's the gist. So just sort of think about those questions as we go through and uh, enjoy. It's uh, Copyright Criminals, distributed by Independent Lens, which is PBS's ind uh, independent um, film distribution arm.